Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. Coming up in the programme, Paris demands answers over the case of Farida Abdelkar, the French citizen who becomes the latest dual national to be detained by Iran. We'll be meeting France's former ambassador to Damascus, whose new book pulls no punches on Western failures in Syria's bloody civil war. We report on how a growing religious conservatism is killing a one-time highlight of Cairo's nightlife, belly dancing. Thanks for joining us. We start with Iran and a case that comes at a critical time in efforts to save 2015's nuclear deal. Tehran confirming the arrest of Franco-Iranian academic Fariba Adelka, but failing to give reasons as to why it had taken place. Well, Paris has demanded answers and access 60-year-old Adel Kaz, an expert in Shia Islam at Paris's Sciences Po University. She becomes the latest in a long line of dual nationals to be held in Iran. This from France 24's Emerald Maxwell. An Iranian government spokesperson has denied knowing who stopped her or why. French-Iranian Fariba Abdelka was arrested in Iran in early June, says the French Foreign Ministry, and it's calling on the Iranian authorities to shed full light on her situation. It's also demanded immediate authorization for consular access, adding that no satisfactory response has been received until now. A prominent anthropologist at Paris's prestigious Sciences Po University, Fariba Abdelka's best-known book is about changes in Iran since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. On the revolution's 40th anniversary in February, she spoke to France 24 about some of her research. The system of surveillance in Iran. Permanent. Yes, and it's a system that came about because in the aftermath of the revolution, at the moment of its birth, the Iranian state was either at war, under surveillance or under pressure from foreign powers. So it developed its security services because it felt insecure. News of Abdelka's arrest comes amid heightened tensions between Tehran and the US and its Western allies over Iran's nuclear program. Tehran doesn't recognize dual citizens, and the academic is the latest Iranian national also holding a Western passport to be arrested while in the country. In a case that's outraged Washington, Iranian-American nationals Siamak and Bakir Namazi are serving 10-year sentences for cooperating with the hostile American government. British-Iranian Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, who worked for Thomson Reuters, was heading back to Britain after a family visit when she was arrested. She's been jailed by Tehran since 2016 on sedition charges she denies. Syria next, where there's been an uptick in fighting in the country's north as the government and its Russian ally intensify strikes on jihadist-held uh, Idlib province. Syria's brutal civil war, now more than eight years old, it's a conflict that has, of course, drawn in world and regional powers, claimed over 350,000 lives and displaced 13 million people. To talk more about it, I'm joined by France's former ambassador to Damascus, Michel Duclos. His book, La Longue Nuit Syrienne, Syria's Long Night, has just been published here in France. In it, he pulls no punches over the failures of Western powers. Thanks very, very much for joining us. Um, My pleasure. Uh, Claude, tell us more about where things went wrong in terms of the Western approach. I think that the, 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 the Western governments uh, never realised or realised uh, much too late what was at stake. That is to say, they thought that it was a kind of uh, crisis at the periphery of the, of the world with no real impact. And so they, they, it's not that they did not take seriously matters in Syria, of course, but they didn't think that it was uh, useful and necessary for them to move in military terms. And the thing is that with people like Assad, only force uh, can be useful. You talk about Assad there. Obviously, from your time uh, in Syria, you saw the regime uh, up close. Tell us what it is that's made that, re that, that regime able to survive where other Arab Spring nations, the regime hasn't been able to cling on. As everybody knows, it's a minority uh, regime. Uh, they have been, uh, the, the Alawi uh, have been marginalized and persecuted for uh, ages. So now that they are in power, they believe that only uh, brutal force can ensure them uh, staying in power. And... In order to stay in power, they are ready to do anything they deem necessary. 
So it was uh, the most brutal answer to the uprising of uh, the old region. What could the West have done differently then? Were they not? They, you start your book in Iraq, for example, about how the West was maybe chastened uh, by Iraq and seen the problems associated with intervention. It was not about invading Syria, of course. Nobody would have uh, seriously contemplated that. Um, a massive uh, military intervention uh, has always been uh, out of question, and I would not have argued myself in favor of a massive intervention. But I think that some selective strikes against some headquarters of the regime at the right moment, that is to say before things went too far, that would have made the uh, people around uh, Assad thinking twice about uh, pursuing the policy of repression. Well, that's what might have happened in the past uh, eight years old now, this conflict. What do you see as the end game in Syria? I'm afraid that uh, there is no end game. That is to say, now the uh, civil war is almost over, even though one may debate about that. But a kind of regional war is uh, going on with Turkey, Iran, Israel, the US also. Uh, if they stay in the north uh, east of the country, so in fact, it's not exactly the end. And, uh, and for the next future, a lot of things can still happen. Michel Duclos, thank you very much for joining us. It's three years now since Turkey witnessed a coup attempt that left 251 people dead. Who was behind it remains a mystery, but the ramifications have been profound. Authorities pushing ahead with the biggest crackdown in the country's history and President Erdogan amending the constitution to vastly increase his powers. Shona Bhattacharya, Ludovic de Foucault and Hussein Assad report on what's changed. Three years ago today, Sadat was on the Bosphorus Bridge. He was there as civilians and soldiers came face to face on the night of the attempted coup. This overpass has been renamed the 15 July Martyrs Bridge. At its base on the Asian side, a new memorial and a museum. <laughs> The names of the 250 martyrs are engraved. And here is a verse of the Quran that reminds us that these people are not dead. They are with God. The government purged elements it believes are linked to the brotherhood of Fatullah Gulen, an imam in exile in the United States who was once Recep Tayyip Erdogan's closest ally. There were law decrees that were created after the coup to allow this massive purge that hit the army, but also teachers and researchers. More than half a million people have been detained, tens of thousands arrested. Prisons have been allowed to double their capacity. Hundreds of thousands of civil servants have been fired and their families ostracized. But some Turks did leave the country, among them self-proclaimed Gulenists. This woman, who prefers to remain anonymous, spoke to us from her new home in Western Europe. I didn't want to go to prison with my children, so I fled. Over there, we know we will be arrested, but we don't know when. We have to live with that fear. I have nothing left in Turkey. There are many countries where they found people and sent them back to Turkey, and no one knows what happened to them. That's why I'm still afraid of the Turkish government. Today, Turkey has more journalists in jail than any other country. Three years later, these Turks in exile are far from able to return back home. Finally to Cairo, where an increasingly conservative environment is threatening what was once a centerpiece of the city's nightlife. Belly dancing was born in the Egyptian capital and used to liven up its famous cabarets. But most of those have now closed and just a few dozen performers remain. In a chic hotel in the capital, Amy Sultan is mixing dance steps with shimmies. The young dancer is currently one of the most sought after in Egypt. In the last four years, demand for her shows has grown. She says that for her, belly dance is more of a way of life than an art form. 
Normally, I don't like to talk very much, so uh, dancing is uh, like instead of talking. When I dance for people, it's a very special experience, especially the uh, Egyptian and the Arab public in general, because they have a very special connection to the music. But belly dancing is under threat. Belly dancers numbered in their thousands just a few years ago, but are now reduced to just a few dozen. Today, Amy has an appointment with her dressmaker. She carefully oversees the making of all of her costumes. The tiniest gap can be costly. We have some rules like to wear shorts under the costume and to um, uh, cover certain areas, of course. We have specific laws that, you know, you could <laughs> get arrested or have a fine if you're not wearing the appropriate costume. This Egyptian dancer paid the price. For this clip, judged to be too provocative, she was sentenced to six months in prison. Threatened by the authorities, belly dancing has also suffered a drop in popularity. Since 2013, strict moral judgments have replaced revolutionary spirit in Egypt. Under the guise of good values backed up by social pressure, Egyptian dancers are slowly giving up, leaving more opportunities for foreign performers. Every year, Randa Kemal organizes a festival for these young apprentices from around the world. Chinese, South Americans, Russians, and even one from France. The aim, carry on the tradition of this art that is today under threat, and above all, combat these new rigid moral standards. I love to, to show all the world what is the meaning of oriental dance, what is this technique, what is this feeling. My dream to change this reputation, my dream to tell everybody that this is work and this art and we are very respectable people. A tall order. In the meantime, better to rely on foreign dancers to keep the Cairo nightlife buzzing. And that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Thanks very much for watching and do stay with us here on France 24.